Alright, so it's been a while since I've done this the last time. Some people have asked me if I would ever do this again. And the first answer was no, and there was a specific reason for that. So basically, early February I received a permanent ban on my main account for specific reasons. It was my bad, my fault, I've deserved it. But during my work holiday I've decided, alright, I'll make a new account and I was suggested by a GM, alright, if you want to play STO again, make a new account, and since I have no life and I'm too addicted to the stupid ass game, I decided, alright, I'll play it again, and here I am, I recreated everything I had, or most things basically, um, most important things for the new changes that have been happening since I was gone, and well, now I'm basically up to speed with the PvP again, I mean, in terms of gear and builds, etc., and I've decided, alright, since so much has changed since my last video, I will make another one now to basically go over everything that's changed, what I'm running right now, and why I'm running it. Contrary to last time, so I've decided to keep it a bit shorter this time. And obviously, there's a reason for that. I mean, you want to just be able to know what's on the ship and just get over with it, right? But I'll also explain some things why I'm still running them for some people that haven't seen any of my videos before and just basically go over the build in its entirety overall and yeah explain why i use what so let's make it quick all right then so this is the ship that i've always been using i'll probably keep using it i've tried many other ships um and many other ships are viable all right so this straight up is that this is not the only ship you can play the good thing is that anyone can fly this ship now it's just of, as of recently with the last update they made it available for everyone to fly Romulan ships or most Romulan ships that are not from promo packs or lock boxes. So you can acquire any of the Zen Romulan ships and fly them, whether you're Klingon, Jem'Hadar, or Federation. So this makes this build accessible for anyone, ship-wise, since many other things aren't exactly cheap and some people might not have the resources. And I'll also explain what are alternatives. Say you're trying to make a cheap build, okay, maybe you can't get this, but I can explain maybe what else you could equip. There are many options, obviously. So, the other ships I would recommend are probably the Muradon right now. Um, any Intel ship, when I go over why. And um, maybe a few other ships. You could say, like, that the Ravager is viable or um, that the Mirror um, Escort Carrier, some of these new ships, they are actually, you can use them, right? You can fly those ships. But they come with drawbacks. You obviously want a fast ship overall. Fast is good. You want to be hard to attack because many people wonder how they can tank PvP. And the main answer is most of the time you cannot. You cannot tank most things. The main way to survive is basically fly away, placate, be a, like avoid firing altogether and just stay out of the line of fire for most of the time. Of course you want to be able to take some hits but nobody can really survive. Um, most people like good PvP players attacks, at least if there's like multiple of them. And a 1v1, alright, I'm going to explain to you how this exact build works because the idea is that this build, it's not exactly what I use, but it's what I would recommend to most people because what I use is mainly, it's more of a vapory style, might not appeal to everybody, also works better in a team than alone, so you got those factors, but I'll also explain what I'm using in my own build, contrary to this one, but the difference isn't that great. Like the overall gear is the same. So, first off, the weapons. I'm using Spiral Wave Disruptors. They are overall the best option right now. I am using dual beams. All right, the beams are the best right now for PvP because of the recent buff to beam overload. First they were crazy strong, then they got adjusted. Now they're very strong. And the main problem why with cannons is not that they do less damage, but that the game is lagging all the time, and that they they just don't fire most of the time, and if they do, they might get interrupted with all the placates and how people pilot. It's really hard to land a full volley. A full volley of cannons would do more damage, like dual heavy cannons, than a dual beam attack. But a dual beam attack is first of instantaneous, reliable, easy to land, and you can come back for more. But with cannons, you're probably not going to get multiple volleys off in one assault, because most of the time, once they're hit, they won't like, let you hit them again anytime soon. Alright, so most I see, I've seen people, they use beam arrays, and there's legitimately no reason why anyone should do this. This is, this is just stupid, because they do 30% more damage, straight up 30% more damage than beam arrays, and 
they, they, they're so easy to use, right? You just have to have the enemy in front of you for a split second and they will fire. Even if the enemy is behind you, they'll complete their attack, right? So you don't even have to worry about it. Essentially, you just have to have the enemy in front of you for just a split second. The only argument for running beamer race is if you're on a ship that has a terrible turn rate. And that's the good thing about this beam change as well, is that cruisers, while still unideal, can at least accomplish something now. If you come with a cruiser with beam overload 3 and all beam the race, uh, it won't be good, but it will be better than a single cannon cruiser before. So it's it's not as bad anymore. You can do that if you really want to, but I do not recommend it. Iron Spirus, crit D only, because my crit hunt is really high. I did basically a lot of math and... For me, essentially, I found that crit D is overall better for PvP than um, damage if your crit chance is high enough. Alright, then the deflector, colony deflector. More criticals, decent stats, self-explanatory. You can equip other things here. You can use a discovery deflector. You can run... Um, yeah, I mean, I think only those two are basically maybe the competitive one if you want to run a different shield. Um, the competitive engines. I always prefer the healing ones, the tactical ones are an option, but I prefer the healing ones because I don't have to, you always speed buff when I use my um, beam overload or scatter volley, I also like to use them at the same time, so that's just much more convenient for me to use the heal ones, and I would most of the time recommend it unless you fly a ship that just can't run many heals, then you really have no choice, but always competitive engines, preferably heal ones. Then core. Uh, competitive, not the best core, but it gets the job done. It gives you control resistance, which is a nice bonus, and obviously it contributes towards the set, which I'm gonna go over in a second. And then obviously the competitive en uh, shields, which I, which you can re-engineer now, so they're not as terrible as they used to be. You can get decent capacity on them now before they had regions times three. Which is not terrible, but it's pretty useless overall. I mean, you, 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 if you run colony consoles, they're going to heal so much that the shield base region is basically relevant so uh, you want to run capacity on the shield and if you run another shield I recommend to either run discovery shield for the two piece um, and then run the core or the deflector or you know whatever it takes you to get two pieces um, or you know you just run the com three piece because overall if you run colony consoles your heals are so great that the discovery two piece basically doesn't become necessary, your heals are so great. With what I'll show you, every colony console proc will give you 225% whole regeneration, or equals that, right? Yeah, heal every two seconds instead of every second, it, they can get nuked, of course, but generally, if you're nuked, you're screwed anyway, um, that, the, that the region won't matter that much that you might get from the Discovery 2 piece, but yeah, that's that. Um, I'm going to show you Discovery 2 piece quick, which is basically, you get... 120% uh, hull regeneration. It says that it scales with maximum hull, but that's not true. It just gives you 120% hull regeneration. Um, some people would consider this really strong, and the truth is it is. But I swear by you that this is not the best choice. I've considered it many times, and I'll explain to you why exactly. So, basically, if you fly a dogfighter kind of build, which is this, this you run colony consoles on a dogfighter, that's just how it works. I run Miracle Worker and Strategist with threatening stance on, obviously, because you're going to take in shots. Miracle Worker, you get, I would, uh, any dogfighter has to run Miracle Worker. It's just must if you get the damage, you get the re some resistances, which don't matter as much. This one's quite nice for entering combat. Uh, the bo uh, incoming healing is really nice because our incoming healing is the only thing that modifies the heal from calling consoles. Things like biotech patch or hull restoration will not affect it. You got fix them up, which is, well, wreck resistance, it doesn't matter, critical heal, you know, these things don't matter. But this is pretty good, like removing drain, uh, removing damage over time, which can be like from the plasma mission particle torpedo, like, you know, just getting rid of that slow. Um, and the shield regeneration, which is, yeah, it's a gimmick, but it's there. And this clicky is also not that bad, because it also buffs colony consoles. So you can get up to 70% more heals from your colony consoles when you activate this. And 70% you might ask, well this is why I'm running Strategist, is because you got um, Show of Force. 
It says while threatening, 20% incoming will healing. Also buffs colony consoles, so together with the 30% from no risk, no reward, 50%. Uh, which is pretty good, right? So your colony consoles, they already heal 5% per console every 2 seconds of your entire HP. And if you have this, it's 7.5% of your entire HP every 2 seconds, which equates to around, or exactly, 225% whole per second. I mean, per minute, right? But it's 225% whole regeneration. So the Discovery 2 piece, compared to colony consoles, it just fades right one colony proc is almost twice and i mean most of the time if you have five consoles you get like what five stacks okay this is rare but now i have literally 1100 percent whole regeneration on top of my base regeneration so you know and you often get more than one two stacks you might often get three sometimes you get none but if you run five this is really rare this inconsistency can happen but it's really rare like here again, four stacks, right? If you run four, four, five console, or even four, but I recommend five if you can, you're, you're good, all right? You're, you're really fine. And the amount of heal you get from this is pretty ridiculous with these specializations. So this also explains the tactical consoles. So I won't go over them after. But yeah, I also give, obviously, cat one damage. 200% if you run five of them. So, you know, they're just amazing. And they weren't uh, on my build last video I made because it was actually before the colony console so that's why I thought this is really due for an update because it's been so long. Alright, after weapons, obviously just run Omnis. Um, for Disruptor you run Martok and uh, Crafted or actually you can run like the targeting link for more accuracy. Uh, I don't run it because of the visual, I'm like, a, you know, I don't like the, the visuals being inconsistent. Um, you can also run anti-proton with the ancient that they've crafted. You can run um, like Polaron with the gamma and the crafted, or you could run um, like yeah. like Tetrion. I think the only one that doesn't have two is plasma, so that's a bit of a downside. But on a plasma, you could just run the piezo beam in the back, and you still have that. And then you just run five duels. So you you got options, right? Um, but yeah, I'd say right now, ideally, you want five Omni, uh, five dual beams and two Omnis. If you run this kind of beam build, there are other options, but that's what I'm covering right now. Um, yeah, uh, if you got a third weapon because you're flying a different ship, a 5-3 or something, you should either run the P's in the back for the technical overload when you pass them by, or a kinetic cutting beam or something, or maybe even like a torp something that like for set or something that slows you could run like a martok torp and drop the console you have options right but uh, i i prefer 5.2 because this is the most efficient user space 5.1 is also okay so that doesn't really kick you that hard but the, the omnis are much more useful than a turret was on a turret uh, cannon build all right uh, experimental weapon graviton implosion charges you have basically um i'd say four options depending on what you're flying. I think the Graviton is the best of them all because of the debuff. Um, it does not decrease the distance from target, whatever. It's just straight up minus 25, which is really strong. It's like almost a beta one. And it does not get cleared by attack team, side team, edge team. It gets cleared by things that just clear debuff in general, but it does not get cleared by any team ability, which is pretty good. Um, the kinetic damage is uh, very strong. It's like, like you see the boss of the Prophets here. It does... Uh, like 20% more damage, but this one fires 50% faster, so you know, it's pretty damn good. And you get the debuff, so I think it's much better than Voices of Profits. Unless you fly a Vapor that already has like a crap ton of debuff on it, then Voice might be the better choice. But generally, Graviton will always outperform Voice of the Profits. Obviously it costs money and Voice can be free, so if you have Voice, you don't have Graviton, I'll use it. Um, you got the Solitan Wave Impeller from this new Razor ship. I have it not available here for some reason. Uh, also pretty good because it's but more for a dogfighter, right? It does very de de it does amazing DPS, it has 100% shield penetration and it scales with your engine power like the cycle haste so it fires like once per second. It's really strong, but it doesn't burst, right? It doesn't give you a debuff and it doesn't burst. That's why I don't like it. I like to kill people quickly. Uh, but the Solitan is not a bad choice. Since it's also a free weapon for a dogfight, I would prefer that one. So if you're a budget player, Dogfighter, you take the Soliton Wave Impeller. Uh, budget player, Vapor, take both of the Profits. If you're uh, like a um, Dogfighter and you have the money, you take either the Sheller or the Graviton. The Sheller 
probably will do more damage and it's still bugged so it does double damage below 5.5 kilometers or something and the graviton has a debuff um, so you, you choose between these devices rechargeable shields battery I actually I found this I mean I didn't find the item but I don't know a year or one and a half ago I was thinking about all right how can I min max because I was trying to get my shield hardness up and I was I knew that this uh, item existed then I had a doff slot free on this warbird all the time like uh, the, the six doff slot because you don't run with a shield polarity none of the other doff slots matter so all right the quartermaster that reduces battery cooldown along with this means you get a pretty huge boost to your shield's power most of the time I have seen a lot of people use that now um, I got no reason to keep this away from people to be honest most people can't afford this and like I have it if you don't use this just run one of these batteries like accuracy or damage um, it's just nice because it gives you the shield power which also buffs the discovery warp core if you have it gives you a lot of HP and um, yeah I mean shield hardness shield region so it's pretty decent I mean you can see my shield region is 1300 and then it goes nearly 2000 shield hardness goes up by 15 percent so it's not bad it's like a free buff you keep spamming it because i never use regular batteries deuterium surplus um it doesn't share the i don't have it on my tray right now because this was a loadout and i just wanted to show them anyway because they will be craftable with the coming uh, season so they will be uh consumable that everybody should use because they do not share cooldown with these evasive they don't share the cooldown with these rechargeable shield batteries or the um, other batteries, I believe, like the energy amplifier, etc. They shouldn't check cooldown. Um, and it basically gives you like another evasive or comp engine buff for that matter. I think it's less than evasive. It's exactly the same as competitive engines. Yeah, it's the same as competitive engines. And it's decks, of course. And um, when you can craft them, yeah, well, there's no reason you shouldn't run them. You just have to make sure you did the mission specters. And then you go to the bottom of the map, just below Karat. And there's this system, I forgot what it's called, with the Ferengi, and that'll unlock them. Um, Alright, I think it's taken already too long here. I'm always so slow, but I like the detail. Alright, you got the dynamic power distributor. I've got this in the last video. Best console in the game, arguably. Not because it's like giving you an unfair advantage, but because every build uses it, like with nearly no exception. PvP and PvE, this is the go-to console. It gives you damage, makes you mega tanky, and it's a heal. Passives aren't bad just has everything you could ever want from a console. Um, the obfuscation screen, uh, it's pretty good because you hit it, you're immune to a vape because you can hit it literally while getting hit to zero and you won't get the dissolve one trigger. Um, the passes are really good and uh, you can also use it offensively. I like to do that now and then you, when I'm like in a situation where I'm not really pressured and there's a guy really tanky. I just use this for a damage buff and then, you know, 120% get to usually uh, gives you a buff to even kill quite the tankiest people. Uh, sen weapon sensor enhancer. Since the beam overload, I don't know why I've kept testing it. It's much more prone to miss. So you really have to min max accuracy. I think you should have at the very least 150. I have the juggernaut rate as well, that's why 130 is enough. But I think 150 at least up to 200. There's some people that run like high defense builds. You might still miss them with 200, but there's so few. Uh, it's not worth like building towards these guys. Um, Mark talk for the uh, two piece and the console itself isn't that bad, bad, mainly for the two piece. It's like I'd, I'd say, alone it's not worth it, but with all these console benefits, power settings, which on a warbird are always appreciated, um, and the two piece, I think it's pretty good. It's worth it if you if you run the two piece on an overload build. Before I would say no on the cannons because uh, running an omni on a cannon build just didn't pay off unless you run overload but even so um, yeah now it's worth it anyway because of the beam overload matter a uh, wormhole generator from the light battle cruiser um, just quite a get good SKP fluid on steroids decent passive kinda but it also heals you lets you get out of situations out of like you know psi spam etc it's pretty good um, if you don't have this get a fluidic um, and there are other budget Oh shit, consoles, you get like the boss face decoy, you can run um, temporal backstep. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's not ex it's not extremely expensive on the on the exchange, like 100 million maybe, and they're really good. Like the backstep's one of the best consoles in the game. I would run it if I had the space, and it's 
which is all cooldowns, but it's a bit jank because of the animation glitch. So it's, you know, it's good. I don't run. I don't know. I do not not run it because it's bad, but because it's jank, and I I like more reliable options. Um, but you should run it if you have it, and you don't have some of the others here. Um, you can also run Alpha Deception Field if you if you're funny, right? <laughs> it's like, I mean, the, the the sky's the limit, right? When it comes to shit buttons, you should run at least two or three in PvP just to be sure. Um, and uh, hostile acquisition. It's more accuracy. Like I said, accuracy is important. Control expertise is never bad. And the clicky is really strong. Because it obviously um, disables things like DPRM. And uh, the, the resistance debuff is pretty huge. So, quite good. It's like, it's just all along, like really annoying console. Helps you kill people passive, which is great. It's, so, no reason not to run it. Colony consoles I went over. I only recommend locators if you're like on a build that does not uh, intend to stay in combat for long. Like if you are built in a way that you can escape combat really quickly, and you try not to get hit at all, so you run exits or so whatever, then you can run locators. Otherwise, colony consoles, all of them, never mix. I have used to do that in the past, but now I'm like down to the consensus, especially with the crit chance being so easy to get from endeavors, etc. Either you run all colony consoles, or you run all locators. I mean, unless you have like uh, universal consoles, too many, you might only be able to run three or four of these. But do not run, mi don't mix locators and colony consoles. Just run either one of them. Exploiters, I've seen some people use, just don't bother. Like on PVE, that might be a point where they'd be better, but you always have other options in PvP. Exploiters are never worth it. Unless you fly like a Psyled Vapor. But I always kind of go against them. Like if you can only do damage with Psyled. You're pretty much useless to your team, you have to wait two minutes. I know people that use Sylt on their rapiers, but they also have decent crit chance without it. It's just like a bonus. But don't rely on it. Um, Alright, I'll go over my trades then. So, you can do have a lot of changes here. So, good day to die, that's a must have on a tactical. Bullcat Technician, it's quite nice, gives you more HP. You don't have to fly this, to be honest, it's not even worth it the way I play. So, I might just replace it with something, I'll check that later. But it's not bad, but you know, I I mean, in a, in a um, dogfighter you'd probably run contexts for kings or something. Because these 10% HP are not going to make a big difference. They're nice, but they're not going to be a difference between life and death maybe once every 1000 times. You get shot down, they're going to save you. So, no big deal. So the submission, super annoying, placate. Uh, no, basically no cost, super annoying, so of course run that. Secret command codes. Um, not really for the heal, more for the resistance against holds and shit. So if someone uses hostiles on you, it's like not as bad. Se uh, self modulating fire. I've kept telling people, don't bother with cannons because the cannons would do so much damage to one facing that the shields would evaporate instantly anyway. Um, unless we reverse shield polarity. In that case, it was the only situation where it was really useful. But now with beams, since you can always land your hits, because like there was no, there's no situation now where your turrets trigger it. And then you can't actually hit the target. But now, you know, you'll hit, so it's not that bad. Um, give you all from engineering R&D to 15. Definitely must have huge damage reduction, 20%. Um, and it can stack. I don't think that the reduction goes up, but 20% is really huge. Um, smuggler's luck is nice, you know, gets rid of the control, gives you defense when your shields drop, kind of when you kind of need it. It's a nice trait. Not saying it's the best, but it's quite nice to have. Terran targeting systems, more crit damage, it's quite nice, right, the slow is insignificant, easy to clear, um, superior accurate, more accuracy, and superior beam training, more damage. Alright, you have other options, you could run, uh, track the beam with unconventional systems, and reduce cooldowns and shit, I'm not on a tactical though, don't think it's worth it. Um, and a dogfighter, maybe repair crews for the region, wouldn't really bother though with colony consoles. Failsafe Scrambler might help against like uh, getting nuke at low percent, something like that. If you like Zalt and you don't want to get nuke immediately, but it's not reliable. Also triggers when you use obfuscation screens, so it's not ideal. Some people are going to kill me, but I keep telling them that these things are pretty obvious by now. I like to be out for a while. Anyone can read descriptions. So really, this is this is trivial. Um, cold hearted here. Now they fixed it with beam overload, so it's pretty good. You can run superior area denial as well if you want to. 
set up like preferential targeting if you need more debuff. Um, about that, you got three staples for damage. Some people run me how ask me how much do how how do I so much damage. Um, so basically, you got cat one, cat two, and final damage. But what's most interesting is that first of cat one never underestimate because it's really valuable. It stretches all your damage. One tactic console is about 5% final damage, so do not uh, underestimate Cat 1. Cat 2, same as critical severity. Have a lot of it, but don't put it if you don't need it. Like, don't run a console for crit damage and sacrifice your survivability. You want to have the Cat 2 pretty high, but don't, like, go overboard. The thing with Cat 1 is that you have, have like, 300% on the weapon, Mark 15. You get 100% from a Starship trade, then a colony console which heal you also gives like really good high amount so um skill tree etc so you 700 percent cat one is no problem so that's pretty good um and then what i was going to play on is final damage the only true way to obtain final damage because we assume everyone is going to run at maximum weapon power so we don't consider that by itself as a multiplier here because you always want to have the weapon power as close as possible to one to five uh what you can do to increase your final damage so like get a significant damage boost, rivaling like alpha, etc. Is override subsystem safeties because it increases your weapon power below beyond one two four. Like say you run OSS three, you get one seven five, and then your damage is like it's like another alpha essentially, or at least almost. Depending on how many buffs you have, it'll either be better than an alpha, or at least equal. But most of the time, it'll be better. Especially if you use both at the same time. So there's no diminishing returns in that sense. OSS will always rip through people. Or you will do much more damage with it. Um, and debuff. So what most people believe is that if I debuff you with, say, cold-hearted, by minus 50, you think you'll lose 50 resistance. But that's not how it works. The math behind resistance is, is pretty interesting, especially for debuffs. And since some kind of change, armor pen and debuff are basically identical. So minus like 10 armor penetration and 10 all damage resistance debuff is the same. Um, just that the debuff can be cleared and armor pen is on you, so it's more reliable, but there's no huge source for armor penetration except maybe science ultimate 25 is pretty good or unshaken resolve, which does currently not work with beam overload. So um, say you have cold hearted or nothing. So if you have no debuffs at all, you are going to do well your, your damage is going to get mitigated by the enemy's resistances and you will do poor damage overall now if you run cold hearted you will do almost 50 percent assuming there are five stacks like 49 percent more final damage towards the enemy's hole regardless of their resistance because it is relative all right Minus 50 all damage resistance does not mean that they lose 50 resistances, meaning if they have 500 resistance, it's not like you will set them to 450. You will do almost 50% more damage relative to their resistances. So if they have a 90% resistance, or let's say 80% resistance or something, and you get cold hearted on them, their resistances will drop in such a way that you will do 50% more damage. So um, if it's 80%, it'll set them back to maybe, like, you know, my brain math is terrible, 70% something. Because if it set them to 60%, that would take double damage. So it's, uh, I think correctly, 70% would be 50% more damage. So um, it's really noticeable, right? It can k take someone from really unkillable or hard to kill to reasonable. Or it can take someone from uh, tanky to killable, quite killable, and can take someone from squishy to basically insta-kill. Like, I mean, it's reasonable to hit people with beam overload for actual, as if they had no resistance, because most people don't have a lot of resistances. So, uh, I'd say they are, they are, of course, diminishing returns, right? So it's like 49% by at minus 50, and I think in order to reach 100%, you need like 109 to reach double damage, and after that it kind of gets kind of poor. But I'd say like a 100 to one. 30-ish is really strong. That's also the way I'm playing usually. So I do like almost double, more than double damage to hold because shields don't care about this. So just to clarify this, damage resistance debuffs are extremely powerful as well as penetration. So 
consider this in many cases uh, resistance is his favorite. The reason I don't run um, superior area denier is because I do run different on my main build and in that case it is probably not going to be better than preferential because I also want a little damage boost against shields. Especially since beams uh, have to chew more through shields than cannons did. So you've got like the, this kind of debatable but like I'd say if you like at 50 debuff or something uh, superior area denial will be better than preferential until you reach like a hundred then I'd say preferential is better, so you have to uh, kind of guess. You can ask me uh, in Discord or comments or whatever if you should run some debuff or not, depending on how much you have. Um, so cold-hearted for the debuff, of course, slow is nice bonus. Preferential, raw damage, you can run superior area denial if you want to. Uh, sub buff chief is not worth it overall. Like, while 15, if you have none, it's very strong. Most of the time you have like 50, 100, then it won't do much, really. Or not more than most other traits would. Emergency weapon cycle is still a good option. You fire faster, but not worth it for me the way I play. You can run it, but I also like to run engines first. I don't like to ha be forced to run em high emergency power of weapons. Um, and since this Reza trait came out, it's, um, I consider it more obsolete than it's ever has been for PvP. Um, invincible, so you don't die instantly. Also buffs colony consoles, just for your information. Not a 50%. Once you go down, they'll heal you much harder. Um, and the freezer trait that's just come out recently, it's pretty pretty good. Because as you can see, it's, it does give me absolutely nothing. But I'll go to some speed. And look at this. 500 all damage resist. My resistance is go skyrocket. Weapon power cost reduces by an insane margin. So for PvP, Unless you're like literally standing still, you're like some kind of weapons platform. This trait is, well, the best trait is called Hearted, essentially. Well, coming to another trait in a second. There is weapon emitter overdrive. Mainly for the accuracy, the crit chance is really nice, and the increased weapon power drain is completely mitigated by um, rhythmic rumble. Like it's no problem, but it's really expensive. But I still do recommend it if there's any way you can get this trait, and you're PvP player, you should really get it. It's really good. So that recently, during my absence, this trade came out like the ultimate bane of PvP. I refuse to use it. I really don't like it, but it's it's really strong. It, many people are forced into using this just because of how good it is. So essentially, it only gives what 528 stealth. Sounds like nothing, but if you run Intel team on any of the Intel ships, your stealth will be high enough to make it basically impossible for most people to target you as long as Intel team is active. There are ways to mitigate this, but they are annoying to use and most tactical players will not have a counter for this. It's really annoying, but it's also not completely foolproof. I think being fast is overall more reliable than Exitus, but Exitus and being fast is extremely strong. Like, it's and it also gives damage and control, like, it's 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 that damn good. So if you run an intel ship, it's expensive but it's super strong. Um, yeah. So that trade, if you if you like into PvP, you're like new and you hate dying, this will make it much harder for people to kill you. And people will hate me to tell new people to use this, but I mean, if if if, if like uh, pros use it or older PvP players like should, it's totally it's complete cancer seriously. So. Might as well just tell everyone if they didn't know yet. But most people are aware of this just because of how harsh it is. It's pretty obvious what what's going on. Um, okay, space reputation. Advanced hull reinforcement, bonus resistance, scales with visa trade because it has a different category. It's like a cat 2 kind of thing for resistances. Uh, crit damage, crit damage, I like crit damage. Crit chance, nice. More crit chance, it doesn't do as much, but I like crit chance. Um, and then while engine overload is still annoying, but I'm going to show you the alternatives. One alternative is, of course, running, um, you can run magnified firepower if your crit chance is bad. Evasive tactics if you uh, have issues with control. You can run enhanced sensors, no, whatever, mind, I mean hardened sensors for some control resistance. It actually works now. You can run the stabilizing phase array. Uh, for that random immunity. It doesn't work, work really well on pilot ships because if you run pilot, immun uh, Im pilot maneuver, the immunity lockout will prevent this trade from going off. Um, so I would not recommend it. Critical deflection if you do not use Miracle Worker at all. Most people should run Miracle Worker. 
but if you don't otherwise you will debuff yourself you can still run it of course on a science or whatever or even on a tactical but you will you will often lose your own damage because of the critical thing of critical heals uh, controlled countermeasures is basically magnified power and power and better if you're cold hearted and then um, on a ship that does not cloak I recommend uh, automatic problematic conduits because uh, it's good region, good heal but on a cloaker I, I kind of go against it because the bubble is visible when you're cloaked so if you cloak and a critical heal makes it go off everyone can see you and the bubble is really obvious and then I've now people that are like how did you see me and cloak you stupid piece of shit hacker well I saw your stupid ass trait and you're too dumb to know that this makes you really visible so if you're if you like if like rely on cloak to survive this trait is a no-go be it on a science of a cloak or a tactical uh, if you use your cloak a lot don't use this trait it's it's really you're kicking yourself stations I think this is going on already too long uh, engineering team I don't like to fly without it especially on this ship some people like to fly without it like for reverse shield polarity do whatever I don't like it it's like a lot of things here are personal preference but this is like one of those things uh, oxabat also personal preference some people like photonic officer you you can do as you please but I think on the pilot warbird you'd have uh, you'd be better off with oxabat on the engineering variant but as many other ships they would do better with uh, photonic or they can't do Ox uh, Octobat at all but I've been using Octobat since the dawn of time so still sticking to it, it still does the job very well Engine 3 because my I rely a lot on speed um, that's why I skilled very much towards engine power like achieving 125 on a warbird is pretty nice and then you run this stuff and look got all three powers here at maximum and Ox I don't care for, so that's pretty nice. And Shields one because weapons doesn't help me much. And it's nice because when I'm out of cloak for a while and I, I get hit by shit, the shields will A trigger my comp engines and B remove debuffs. Like weapons would too, but the comp engine buff is a quite bon nice bonus. And it does like uh, remove shields offline and stuff. So it's like a nice defensive option after 15 seconds uh, after you hit engine. So once you're like still in combat, you're in trouble. It's much more useful than weapons. And the 10% cat 2, I can't be bothered really. It's not. It's nothing. Um, tactical team for the shield rebalance. Tactical team clear buff clear. And I have so many tech slots that there is nothing better to put. Scatter volley to trigger either preferential targeting, uh, superior area denial, and colony consoles, of course. So, as you can see, no colony consoles at all <laughs> when it happens, and that's a bit of a problem, but it's not as often as something, right? Uh, Omega 3, because it's not cannons anymore, you can also run Beta 3 for more damage, um, but obviously, it's at the risk. And then uh, Overload 3, because you always run the highest copy of your damage buff there you can have. Um, and then the science team to clear science debuffs, comp engine proc. I always like to have three comp engine procs, so hold together engine team, side team, and clean getaway to run away, like maximum speed possible. And let's see if I'm still screwed. No, yeah, I got three. See, most of the time you get, you get at least one, alright? Two most of the time have three, but like zero is quite rare. You're more likely to get four or five than zero. Um, and that's that. Um, so this is like the most important things to note. I might have missed things. It's been a while since I did this. Uh, if there's any questions, just ask me to like a follow up. I'm gonna link my new Discord, uh, like handle in the in the description. So you know, if you have any questions, you can add me. I don't know. Most people already have me anyway. That would watch this. <laughs> um, I had a skill tree of course. This skill tree is not optimal, I've been messing around. High power levels, high speed, um, extra critty, no team points, people hate me for this. But it's just, you know, let's like, I made, this, the skill trees haven't changed since I made, explained how you should skill in the other video. Just balanced, use what you need, don't skill things you don't need. I mean if you have like a point one critty, that's like min maxing, but like don't skill into hold plating at all. If you run Reza trade, like what for? Oh, because when you get nuked, but when your nuke to resistances are so low that this is not going to save you. But this is my argument. You could run like, many say, oh, pa we need passive region. We need passive resistances. We need passive to this. Because if we get nuked, yeah, but if you get nuked, you have no buffs. Anyone will cut through you, especially with overload. Like, it won't matter. So, 
if you get nuked, your objective, hit screen, wormhole, just get the fuck out. Don't, you can't tank shit when you're nuked. So don't tell yourself the opposite. Unless you're like a full healer, being nuked means I don't want to get hit within the next three seconds or I'm dead. Oh, well, or being immune, of course, that always works. But yeah, that's that's basically that. And uh, if I missed anything, let me know. Um, uh, I'll help anyone who asks, and that's that. I hope you appreciate it in some way. And yeah, I'll see you next time.